Museum. And based on what he had and other notes from Ann Butler at Kentucky State University and Juanita White in Louisville and others who've assisted us, and they're all acknowledged in the book, that's how we were able to put all this together. Ancestry.com is a wonderful resource, and then we have a lot of history books about Frankfurt that contain these people's names. So it was a fascinating account. Also in the book is a short chapter on the Green Hill Cemetery and the African American Monument. There's only four Civil War monuments to African American soldiers, and one of them is in Frankfort, Kentucky. And it's been there since the 1920s, and so we have the history of the monument written by John M. Trowbridge and the story of the African American troops from Frankfort and from Central Kentucky, as well as Lebanon and Camp Nelson. So it's a very valuable resource tool, as well as the story of what happened in Frank. Wonderful. The war. Wonderful. I like it. I love it a lot. Sounds good. We'll have to check this book out. You all, listen, if you are interested in getting a book, get this one, <laughs> In Battle Capital. It's written by James Pritchard, and it has some contribu um, contributions. I keep struggling over that word with uh, Russ Hatter. Thank you so much for agreeing to be on camera. We really Thank appreciate you. it. We appreciate it. I'm standing here with author Stephen Vest, and he's written a book called Unexpected Inheritance. Tell us a little bit about the book. The title packs a quite a surprise, it sounds like. Well, it's a story about family and memories and traits. And, you know, there's those things that your parents hope to impart to you that they either fail or don't, you know, either do or don't. And uh, there were many lessons I hope that I learned from my father as an example that I hope to pass on to my own kids, which some of them stuck and some of them didn't. But then there were lessons I really did not want to pass on from my grandmother, many of which I did. And, you know, lots of times you open your mouth and you hear these people coming out and you know where they came from. And it's about memory. It's about growing up. It's about family. Wonderful. Now, on the back, you quoted Mick Jagger, mm -hmm. and you said you can't always get what you want. Right. What What did you want readers to take away from that? Well, like what I said, I mean, there were things, that, there were lessons that I learned from my dad who I saw as being a very nice, sincere person, mm -hmm. and I hope to pass those on to my kids. And I was successful in some ways and not in others. Mm -hmm. My grandmother could be very domineering and negative, and I didn't want to pass along a lot of those traits, but I did. <laughs> and some of them actually have real value. So, you know, you don't know where things are going to come from, but sometimes you get good things from bad places and bad things from good places. So. Wonderful. Now, you've written, you've written two books. Well, actually, I've written, uh, there's a book, it's a collection of stories from Kentucky Monthly Magazine. That was written several years ago called That Kind of Journalist. And then this one is a book called Kentucky's 12 Days of Christmas, and it's a collection of stories all related to Christmas written by Kentucky authors. There's 27 different authors, poets, songwriters included in the book, um, including uh, five that are here at the book fair today. Wonderful. Now, is this your only book that is centered around Christmas? Uh, the only one about Christmas, yes. Wonderful. And Mamaw, who appears on the cover of Unexpected Inheritance, is also in the Christmas book. Now, Mamaw, who is Mamaw? That's my mother's mother, my grandmother. Oh, wonderful. Yeah, this is her on the cover. And what did she think when she saw herself on the cover uh, of the book? She hasn't, she hasn't seen herself on her. So uh, I don't know what her daughter will think of it either. So gotcha. That's my mom. So we'll see. <laughs> Got you. Well, I love it. Thank you so much for agreeing to be on, on camera. Yeah, and pleasure. best of wishes to you on your books. Right, thank you so much. Well, if you all are anything like me, I'm sure you love to eat. I'm standing here with Rona Roberts, who's the author of this wonderful cookbook, Classic Kentucky Mills. Tell me a little bit about what you got cooking inside this book. A lot of what's going on in this book is the stories of 10 producers in Kentucky, 10 people that make the great food that we get to eat if we um, buy from farmers markets especially and from local markets. And these foods are organized in five meals. And the meals are, they go around the seasons and they have a lot of vegetables, really good ones that grew in Kentucky. Kentucky grains, Kentucky meats, Kentucky cheese, and all the meals are paired with Kentucky uh, music, first of all, and Kentucky wine, beer, Kentucky roasted coffee, and Kentucky tea. Wonderful. So it's a very, very Kentucky book. What are some of the traditional meals that you have inside of this book? The, the 
first meal is a roast shoulder meal. So it can be roast pork shoulder, roast lamb shoulder, or roast beef shoulder. And it's got a lot of savory flavors in it and a little bit of sorghum. So, Tell us, uh, what is sorghum? Sorghum is a very um, traditional Kentucky form of sweetening that is made from one ingredient, sorghum cane. And it was made starting in 1850 and coming along till now. Farmers can grow this, make it on their own farm, and not have to go to the store and buy white sugar. And it's much better for us, and it tastes really good. So a lot of my recipes in this book use just a little tiny bit of sorghum. It's my good luck charm. Um, and there's also some recipes that depend on sorghum as well. Um, the, but the book includes a roast chicken dinner, my mom's favorite uh, way of roasting chicken, a country beans and greens dinner, and a summer cookout dinner made from all Kentucky hot dogs, hamburgers, beans, potato salad, slaw, all these Ooh, good uh, things. Comfort food. Yeah. Sounds wonderful. What's one of your favorite things inside the book? What's your favorite recipe? My favorite recipe at the moment, and it's just because this is the season, is in the first meal, and it's a winter roast vegetable salad. And uh, so it starts out with a bit of any kind of greens. It can be kale greens sliced really fine, or it can be regular lettuce. We can still get uh, locally grown lettuce. And on top of that, it's a pile of roasted uh, winter vegetables. So think like a mix of sweet potatoes and onions and turnips that are still warm. And then that's all drizzled with a sorghum bourbon vinaigrette oh, wow. developed by Chef Wita Michael. She let me use her recipe. Well, it's official. I think she's made me hungry. Oh, good. It's about lunchtime. <laughs> that is for sure. Tell us, you've also written the book Sweet, Sweet Sugar Gum. Sweet, Sweet Sorghum. Okay. Tell us uh, yes. about what that is. So this uh, this is the book I wrote first. This is this book is three years old. And I wrote this book because so few people know about sorghum. So sorghum is a, a form of syrup. comes from the sorghum cane plant that grows extremely well in Kentucky. Kentucky and Tennessee, we're sort of sorghum central for the United States, although sorghum has been grown and produced in all of 48 states, and it's grown all over the world. Sorghum cane can produce this wonderful sweet syrup that I'm holding that's made in Woodford County, and it can also produce uh, fiber and fuel. So it's a fantastic plant. It's good for Kentucky farms. So I wrote a sort of a sorghum 101. It's not really a cookbook. There are eight recipes in it that tell you how to use sorghum. And today, people who buy that that little book are getting a little a free little three ounce of sorghum to get them started. All it's right. Starter sorghum. Yes, and then they'll have to come back, right? That's right. <laughs> then they go find sorghum in their local in their local communities, and it's everywhere if you know how to look. Wonderful. Well, congratulations to you on your book. Thank you so much. Your meals sound wonderful. Thank you. You all head out to the store, check out this book, and get cooking. Sure check that out. Thanks so much. Thank and you. I'm sitting here with the treasurer of this whole event, Tom Midkiff. Tell us how the Kentucky Book Fair is funded every year and how it gets the money to do this amazing event. Sure. Uh, most of our funding comes from the sales from the books on our Children's Day and then the main day event, which is today. Um, so th the bulk of what we receive is, is from that. We do we, ha we have some grants as well from uh, a couple of uh, organizations, but the, the bulk of our money has come from the sales that the authors generate for us. So. Does any of the money go towards public libraries or anything of the sort? That's where pretty much all the money goes. So we have some expenses that are fairly consistent at this point, but. Uh, we have a part-time manager, some very low overhead because of the events basically one day a year, but um, everything else goes to libraries. So, And are they all inside of, are they in a certain area of Kentucky or are they usually the Frankfurt, uh, the Frankfurt Library or just all over the state of Kentucky? So we have a, every year we ask, uh, we have an application period where any library in Kentucky, mostly public school libraries, uh, can apply to receive monies from us and then we basically determine that based on need and typically about six or seven libraries in the state receive monies from the book fair. Wonderful. So you all get out and purchase some books. This is not just, um, this is helping kids all over, not just kids but adults and anyone else um, who has a library in their city, which is almost every city. So thank you so much. We really appreciate it. This is a wonderful event. Thank you. Appreciate and, you all being here. Mm -hmm.
We, I'm standing here with Robert Earl Houston, who wrote the book, See You in the Morning. And tell us a little bit about this book that you have. Well, the book is a collection of eulogies that were preached in the pulpit at First Baptist Church in Frankfurt, where I'm the senior pastor at. And I wanted to try to capture some people's life stories, a variety of persons from teenagers all the way to senior adults that have passed and gone on and had their services at First Baptist. It's a great book as far as understanding what happens with death and what happens on the other side and so on and so forth. Wonderful. Now, what what made you collect these um, these particular sermons that you put together? Uh, well, I'm, right. I'm a I'm a reader anyway, and I read a lot of. There's a lot of books out there on how to preach, what to preach, but very little about sermons relating to funerals, especially in the African American community. So these are people that all the way from PhDs to kids in high school that died, and to be able to try to translate. Uh, what happens in their circumstance in their life, celebrating their life, mm -hmm. and then also as we celebrate their life, they're able to help and encourage somebody else. Wonderful. Now, is this the first book that you've written? First book I've written. I've got a part two coming out next year. Right. I'm excited about that. All right. And is it part two of See You in the Morning, or is it part two of See You in the Morning? Uh, unfortunately, uh, most pastors we get a, a great supply of sermons that you preach at eulogies, and so mm -hmm. I've done about. 40 or 50 since I've been in the area, and that's the first 13, and then we've got another set coming out next year. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for agreeing to be on camera. Best of wishes to you on your book. This is awesome. I like it a lot. And I also want to get this lady right here on camera, if you don't mind. She has a book, and it's called Come and See, Jesus is Alive. And tell me a little bit about the book. Well, it actually was written by my father and finished by my brother, who is a pastor. And it's about um, the role of the Holy Spirit in a believer's life. And it chronicles my dad's life, his whole life, uh, about being sold out to Christ and how the power of the Holy Spirit can be alive in your life. And it's Come and See, Jesus is Alive. Wonderful. When was this book published? Um, about a year ago. About a year ago. Yeah. Wonderful. Wonderful. And are you in the book at all? There is a part in the book uh, about a miracle that I personally witnessed, and it is in there, yes. Wonderful. I love to see it. Thank you so much for agreeing to be on camera. This is awesome. I'm sitting here with Cynthia Albright Parrish, who's the author of this book, The Language of Love for the Little Ones. Tell us a little bit about the book. Uh, I was inspired by my own grandchildren to do. I'm a form former first grade teacher. I work, a real estate agent, work with families constantly, but tutor, uh, tutoring is what I like to do when I get a chance. And seeing young children who need to be oriented toward uh, books at a much earlier age. Um, my book is to inspire little ones from the crib on, um, and it grows with the interaction, but it's also to encourage positive language and um, the, the kind of loving relationship that you every child deserves. Wonderful. Well, the illustrations inside are really nice. And we have L, lively, lovable lion. I like it a lot. What age range is this book for? Uh, I think that most little infants can be comforted by a book before they even recognize what you're doing. But hearing their parents' voice, um, I've been told by friends who have shared this book with their infants, colicky infants, can point out a uh, you know, uh, an illustration long before you expect them to just because of the repetition. But it's more about teaching children to listen to your voice, um, discovering things together, and being playful with reading to make it fun. And they kind of lead the way after you get them started. That is for sure. All kids like reading time, especially right before bed, right? Well, the one book always stretches to five, you know? <laughs> that, that, that's the standard procedure. Just a way to stay up, just an extra 20 minutes, right? Worthwhile for both parties. I gotcha. Well, thank you so much for thank agreeing you. to be on camera. This sounds like a wonderful book. And I'm sure it's it's touching children's lives everywhere. Well, I want to get it out, and I, I'm trying to find charities to share it with, um, but it's it's I've tested it on my four little ones that are under five, and um, any child can enjoy it, that's for sure. Good. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Take care. I'm standing here with Mark Wayne Adams, who's an illustrator and an author, and he's written a lot of great children's books. Thank you. Tell Thank us you. a little bit about what you write about. Well, I write about numerous things. I've written actually three picture books, but I've illustrated over 40 picture books in the past 
six years, mm -hmm. and the books have won over 50 different picture book awards. And on the table, we have just a few of the books that I've illustrated in the past few years. Tell us a little bit about the Fart Fairy. I oh, like the title yeah. of this book. How did you come up with the name? I'm sure <laughs> children love it. Well, actually, the author is to blame for the name. She is Miss Bobby Hinman. Mm -hmm. um, she writes her series and blames things on fairies. Okay. So inside each one of her books, it includes an audio CD with a story narration. But the Fart book also has its own song. And it goes to the tune of Pop Goes the Weasels. <laughs> So most adults buy that book for other adults, just for the song. Gotcha, I love it. Which one's your favorite book out of all the books that you've written? You're going to make all these authors mad at me. Oh, no. no. I, have, I have different things in each book that I really enjoy. So gotcha. I put a little bit of myself in each book. Mm -hmm. So whenever I see one, it's kind of like seeing your children. You go, well, yeah, you're my, you're my favorite, but you're my favorite, but you're my favorite, too. So, I yeah. totally understand. Now tell us a little bit about some of your drawings. Can you show a, a couple of them for us? Sure. And how did you get the inspiration to start drawing? How long have you been drawing? Oh, I've too? been drawing since I was about three years old. And the first time I drew something was scribbles on paper. Mm -hmm. And my mom said, wow. And I thought, what is she talking about? Wow. Um, so I would scribble and scribble. And then one day I drew something that looked like a heart. Mm -hmm. And she picked me up and gave me a big hug. And I thought, I don't know what this is, but I can do better. Uh -huh. So I kept drawing stuff like this. Um, I've been drawing for over 40 years, and let's see, we have a few more in here. Oh, that's Most kids love the horses, so I draw quite a bit of horses. I see about 90,000 students every year in elementary schools. Most of the time I'm in Kentucky for about four months out of the year, and, but I live in Orlando, Florida. Wow. So. Well, congratulations to you on your books that you have here, and your drawing skills are amazing. I Thank like you. it a lot. Thank you so much, Thank Mark. You. <laughs> I hope you all have enjoyed this year's 2014 Kentucky Book Fair. My name is Lindsay McGaha with FPB TV. Until next time, thank you. <laughs>